All right, turn back with me to Deuteronomy chapter 6, and we're going to look at that next little bit, uh, little section. <clears throat> the reason we begin in Deuteronomy chapter 6 with the priorities of the home and the priorities of focusing this next generation uh, on the Word of God is that ideally your practices, what we're going to talk about here today, uh, are going to be informed by your priorities. This is almost inevitable for us uh, just as humans. We inevitably prioritize things. If you read any Jonathan Edwards, one of Jonathan Edwards' key contributions in religious affections was helping us understand how our hearts do what they do. And our hearts are always operating with an eye toward understanding our environment and our world around us. And second, our hearts are always operating by making value judgments. Uh, and we illustrated that a little bit with the homes of origin that you came from when you first got married. You remember in that first year of marriage, you were beginning to meld and to mesh the values and priorities of two different homes into this new home that you were a part of. And one of the things you recognize when you get married early in life is that every marriage is a cross-cultural marriage because you have practices and priorities and values and habits that have uh, come in from your family of origin that in many ways are um, very important to you. They've formed the way you've thought about life. I went to Jared and uh, Jared's talk on um, something real good, culture, uh, or an engaging culture, and Reagan gave the example of coming from Oklahoma and singing the Boomer, Boomer Sooner is a song that they sing. Uh, right, and it forms the kind of like you think about, you know, if you're a college football fan, the roll tide uh, kind of thinking. Uh, when we were early in our ministry career, we would uh, we would counsel and uh, and kind of like our we would minister to young adults. And I remember in the context of that young adult world, there was this guy who really had a hard time with the fact that his wife just wasn't into Clemson football the way he wanted her to be. And they were wrestling, like, is this right? Can we can we Come this obstacle? Is this the woman for me? Uh, and, and you recognize that <clears throat> inevitably, as, as families, uh, you know, begin, you're making decisions about, um, about the priorities that you're going to have in your life and home, which is obviously started at the beginning there of Deuteronomy chapter 6. All of us are making disciples, right? Because making disciples is essentially teaching the truth to this next generation. The question is whether or not we're making good ones or not. The question is whether or not in our home are we accurately reflecting the heart of God, the revelation of who he is, the gospel of Jesus Christ in our homes in ways that our children can understand this is the most important thing about my mom and dad. This is the most important thing about our home. This is the most important thing uh, about the decisions and the practices we make. And uh, when it comes to practices, you'll see this as we go through this passage, uh, a lot of our practices can sometimes just be kind of arbitrary. It's like, no, we're the family that wears belts. And that becomes, you know, and, and you've seen this, you know, we're the family that's Clemson football. We're the family that fill in the blank and whatever it is. And we have a tendency to tie our value to our practices, which is why we have to start with the expression of God, the revelation of who he is, his moral will and design for the world, and then to stand into practices that reflect the fact that we have a God in heaven who's the maker of heaven and earth, the sea and the dry land, who came to earth and incarnated as Jesus Christ, who lived, died, was buried, and rose again, right? Those are key elements about what the Christian faith is all about. And I'm going to illustrate that as we go through this passage here today, but uh, ultimately what we're trying to do in our practices is kind of what the book of Revelation does. When you get to the book of Revelation, you have heaven and earth getting closer and closer together. There's more and more interaction between what heaven and earth is doing. And that's what we're trying to do for our children in our practices is make the connection between a God who has spoken, a God who is, a God who loves them, a God who's engaged and involved in our lives all the way down to incarnating and coming among humanity and then making sense of that incarnational reality in the practices that we live out, right? Does that make sense? So we're trying to make those connections for our children all along the way. All right, so Deuteronomy chapter 6. <clears throat> you all there? It should be on the screen behind me and before me and all around me. <laughs> That's a song, isn't it? Um, Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4. Here's how it starts. Hear, 
O Israel. This is uh, one of the key, this is repeated in, I think, at least three of the Gospels, at least multiple times in Jesus' teaching as one of the most important commandments in all of the Old Testament. It's called uh, to modern day Jews what uh, they'll call it the Shema, which is from the Hebrew word to hear. Uh, it forms a consistent pattern in the life of the Jews. This was recited morning and evening in the lives of the Jews. It was a consistent pattern that, that laid out. You have Jesus who uh, has lawyers come to him who say, what's the most important command in the law? And Jesus quotes this, and he quotes, You'll, uh, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. He quotes Deuteronomy and Leviticus. So in light of all that we've seen in Deuteronomy 6, 1 to 3, <clears throat> we've had a connection in one to three between hearing and doing. Remember that? That you, had, you were to hear these commands and then you were to do them, to keep them, that you might live long in the land the Lord is giving to you. So there was this recognition that I need information from the outside to shape the priorities that I have and therefore the obedience I'm going to exhibit before the Lord. Now in, Hebrew, uh, in Hebrews, different book, in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4, you have a different connection that Moses makes. He connects the hearing of the community to a theological statement about God, which means for this next generation of community that has buried their parents and is getting ready to go into the land, this community is meant to be a listening community. This community, generally speaking, is meant to hear God. That's, that's, that's what is meant to mark these people. And let me bring that into 2024. One of the things that you do when you gather with your family and you head to church in the morning is you make a consistent practice. You are putting something on display in the life of your family. Even though that you can't remember what the sermon was three weeks ago, you are doing something that is weaving a practice into the life of your family, which says God has the right to, to do two things. One, to interrupt our rhythms in our week. And two, he has the right to speak, and we have the opportunity to hear. So some of the, we live, you, listen, you guys know this, we live in a primarily individualistically driven culture where my desires, my ambitions, my hopes, my dreams, my future, my successes are all individually defined. I have plans for my family where we're gonna go, what I'm gonna do, what we're gonna think, and that can inevitably drift into evaluating my life essentially upon selfish, um, selfish values. And one of the things that attendance with God's people in the presence of God's word preached, where it's sung and where it's prayed and where it's heard is modeling for our children and modeling for our homes that God has the right to speak into our lives. And when we gather, we don't just gather because, I said this yesterday, we don't just gather because I want my kids to see people, which is true. We can see people at Tanger outlets. We can see people in a lot of different ways. But I want my kids to see people who have the same ambition in our hearts that I think God wants for his people. I want to see my kids know other people in relationship who are saying, we're going to close our mouth and we're going to let God talk. So... The prioritization, this was a part of my upbringing. I don't know what kind of upbringing you had. If, if attendance in the church and listening to God was a priority. But as Moses begins here, he begins with a corporate value that y'all gather and y'all are meant to be a hearing people. So when we talk about church attendance, we don't do it so that I can get a gold star in heaven as a pastor and go 68% of them came every week. That's not really the goal of why we gather. We gather and pray and sing with brothers and sisters in Christ because we're making listening to God a priority. We're, making, we're inviting God to speak into our world. And something powerful happens biblically when the church is gathered. There seems to be an, an affirmation of God's people gathering around to hear who he is, what he says, and how they ought to order their lives. So one of the very first practices that Moses lays out for us is a corporate practice. Because one of the things that I've recognized about my children, and maybe you have too, is that my children are fundamental materialists. You know what I mean? Everything is about what they can see, touch, taste, hear, feel, right? 
That's the way they live their life. Whatever matters in their life are things that they can grab, they can hold on to, they can see, they examine, they can touch, they can jam in their mouth. They can. We had a daughter, uh, one of our daughters had a, a tendency to put things up her nose. I don't know why, but it was one of the ones where she got like a magnet stuck up our nose, which we found out after three days is real bad. Not good at all. Uh, so we finally took her to an ENT, and we found that she had this tendency to take little bitty things and just kind of... <laughs> and she'd go on about her day. Whatever that feeling was for her, that sense for her was incredibly important to feel. Uh, and one of the things you recognize with your children is your children are always engaging and interacting with the material world in a variety of ways. And that goes from, you know, this big to this big, right? We're, we're all... We're all connecting to our material world. And one of the things that we recognize as Christians is that when we gather together uh, as the church, it's through hearing God's word that it seems God interrupts and connects our life to his life. He does something in the gathering of the body. Here, let me just give you a couple of scriptures on this that I think help to illustrate it. 2 Corinthians 4 talks about this. So I, I talk about, right, the, I began with this idea of um, practices that help connect heaven and earth, help connect our spiritual and our physical lives. Paul says this in 2 Corinthians 4, we don't lose heart, our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day, for this light and momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison, as we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen, right? Because, now here's what he says, imagine trying to explain to your four-year-old that we're trying to look at the things that are unseen, it makes zero sense. But Paul says it's the, the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. We're trying to connect our practices, and our practices really function like the alphabet. They're not language, and they're not talking, but they're the basics, the, the patterns, the grammar that help our kids understand what the, our life with God is like. Paul says this in Galatians 2. He says, foolish Galatians, who's bewitched you? It was before your eyes that Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified. And commentators note, when Paul says that, he says, in my preaching and teaching of Jesus and declaring to you who he is, you are getting a spiritual image of what Jesus did on the cross for you. You're able to engage and understand the reality of who Jesus is and what he has done. Faith comes by hearing, and hearing comes by the word. Right, so the beginning of Moses' exhortation, now what he's going to do is give you the reality of God and, and how God has chosen to reveal himself here in Deuteronomy chapter 6, but he begins with the fact that quite simply, our practices as a community, our practices as a family are meant to be listening practices. So if you think about your parenting and you audit it for a moment, how much time do you give to intentional listening to God? What are the rhythms that you have in your home where you close your mouth and you open your ears? What are those patterns that you, uh, that you can put in place where you are intentionally saying what God says is of utmost value to us? We so want to hear what God says. Because a lot of times we'll go, to, we'll go to friends and we'll go to neighbors and we'll go to parents to get their input and their insight to make sure that we're hitting all the bases and doing all that we need to do as parents. But we need to make sure, too, that our practices, our, our Christian disciplines are characterized by a willingness to prioritize hearing from God. Now, watch what he says here. I said a little bit of this yesterday, but he says, Oh, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God. So I won't, I won't spend a lot of time on that. I talked about that yesterday, but this is one of the most common phrases repeated all the way throughout Deuteronomy. It's a reminder that God is in covenant relationship with his people. So again, this listening people is meant to be connected to a God who has uh, invested in them, who has uh, rescued them, who's forgiven them, who's initiated relationship with them and brought them to himself. Therefore, this is the thing that you need to hear, practice, remember. I have a daughter who uh, right now has a, has a, well, she just, she struggles in the way that she looks at life, she looks at situations. 
And one of the things I've done for her is I said, think about a picture frame. And I want you to think about an empty picture frame. And I want you to take that up. And I want you to imagine that as you look at scenarios in life, that you're choosing to take that picture frame up. And it's got four sides. And I gave her four truths. And I said, I want you to pretend that you're looking through that picture frame of those truths at this situation. And the real is, God, is lo God loves me. God is strong. God's got a plan. He'll never leave me. And I say, God loves me. And I make her do it. What, what are the things, how are we going to look at this situation? God loves me. God's got a plan. What did I say? God is strong. Real good. God will ever, never leave me. God loves me. God's got a plan. God is strong. God will never leave me. Now, is that help? And I just, I do dumb stuff in my family like that all the time. I just make up stuff all along the way. And I go, I want you to think about this. Imagine if your perspective was guided by those realities in the way that you look at this relationship, this worry, this hope, this dream, this failure. Would you be able to navigate those better than you are right now? Yes. Right? <clears throat> well, let's, let's do that together. So Moses says, here's this theological truth that's going to carry the next generation together. We're not going to talk about obedience. We're going to talk about who God is. And this is a part of how we talk to our children. We're reminding our children. Because how, how often do you forget about who God is? I mean, about every 20 minutes, don't you? You go, oh, man, who's God in this? I forgot. I don't know. Well, I, here's what Moses does. Here's the theological truth that's going to guide this next generation. Hero Israel, the Lord, our God. Number one, he's our God. Number two, he's one. Now, there's about three different ways commentators explain what that means. Number one is that he's unique among all gods. He's different than every god. One of the things that uh, God says in Exodus chapter 12 when he gets ready to uh, execute all of the judgments upon the, the nation of uh, Egypt, he says, on all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgments. I am the Lord. And if you go through those judgments, you recognize that a lot of those judgments pertain to the pantheon of gods that were represented by the Egyptian way of life and thinking. And what God is doing in the, in the plagues is not simply rescuing his people, but he's obliterating any other god that has claim and to authority and power over his people. So number one, he's singular among the gods. When you get into the book of Joshua and they get to Jericho and they go and talk to Rahab, one of the things that Rahab says to the spies is, spies, we heard of you and what happened at Egypt. And they're 40 plus years from that moment when they came out of Egypt. And they go, we were terrified of this God. We've got no hope. There's a reason the city is shut up tight because nobody thinks we can handle your God. So number one, he's, he's unique among all the gods. Number two, he's of singular motivation. God is one, which means God's the same in the light and in the dark, right? He's the same in uh, yesterday, today, and forever. He was the same as he was in the desert. Is going to be the same God that we carry with and we walk with in the, in the promised land. So there's a God who's not two-faced. God doesn't... There's no, you know, every uh, good and perfect gift comes down from the Father of lights with whom there is no shadow or shade of turning. God's the same. Now, is that helpful for a generation of people who've come out of the wilderness and are now going to step into a polytheistic culture with all sorts of different gods and uh, warped religious expressions and sacrifice of children and <laughs> cultic idolatry? They've got to remember, we walked with this God, and it was just us and God in the wilderness. Now we're going to step into a polytheistic culture again in this new land with all these people who make all these promises about whether or not these gods can sustain us and help us and give us hope and secure our crops and have victory over our enemies. And Moses is telling them, he's singular among the gods, and he's singular in motivation. This God that you have a relationship with does not change. He's always consistent. But number three is the response. Because the third way to understand is that this is the God that we are meant to have soul devotion to. This is meant to be a singular relationship between us and our God. And that forms, I think, the background of what you get here in verse 5. Just as obedience and reverence to those commands are put together in the previous paragraph, Moses is now going to join God's character and our responses together. Because our practices really have to flow in our families from the reality of who God is. Your practices can't simply be disciplines in your home. 
They need to be personal, right? They need to, they need to flow from an appreciation of who God is and what he is like and what he has done and the stories and the truths of our faith that have carried through the, all of the scriptures. I had a, I've said this before. I just had a seminary professor who, as he taught through the Old Testament, said that uh, what God has done in the past is a model and a promise for what he'll do in the future, but he's too creative to do the same thing twice. What God has done in the past is a model and a promise for what he'll do in the future, but he's too creative to do the same thing twice. One time they go into Jericho, they march around with the ark, all the walls fall down. The very next battle, you know what they do? They use military tactics. Why is it different? God told them so. So there's this understanding that our relationship with God is the foundation of our practices, not some set of wooden, obedient uh, um, lists. So here's your first one, verse five. Number four, ver verse four is your revelation, right? Verse five, six, seven, eight, nine are all your responses. Here's your first response in verse five. You shall love the Lord your God. Now, we've talked about this before. Even in the book of Luke, we've talked about this. When Jesus talks about uh, if you're going to come after me, you have to hate your father, mother, brother, sister, son, all that, right? And we've talked about those allegiances that characterize our relationship with God. This is an allegiance verse. This is a, a wholehearted commitment verse, which is what he goes on to say here in the remainder of this passage. But I want you to see that loving God always comes second because we already have a relationship established with us by God and what he's done to rescue and save and uh, bring his people to himself. We've had God act in history to bring us to himself, to establish a relationship, to prove his faithfulness, love, and concern and care for us. Now, the only appropriate response is love of God and dedication to him. So our love of God is not trying to get God to love us. Our love, we love because he first loved us, right? And that carries into your New Testament. If you want to understand who God is and what he is like, you look at Jesus. He's the exact representation of his nature, Hebrews says. In him dwells the fullness of God bodily. So when we talk to our children, we're bringing our children back to the one singular true reality that God has proven himself to us in Christ. God loves us absolutely because of what Jesus has done for us. Therefore, we love. Therefore, we respond. Therefore, we're devoted and we submit our, uh, our hearts to him. That's where Moses goes here. You'll love the Lord your God. Now watch this. With how much? Some? No, all. Does God get a part of my life? Does loving God exist on Sunday for those 90 minutes? That's when I love God. No, it's, it's all. God has the right to demand everything of you. Are you okay with that? Everything. He has the right to expect wholehearted commitment, complete, reckless abandon of placing yourself in his hands. So Moses says the only natural response to a God like this, a God who has called us into relationship with himself, is total holistic love. Love is with all of your heart. That's the foundation. All throughout the Old Testament, the heart is actually literally the kidneys. It's the, it's the deepest parts of who we are. It, it is the uh, out of the heart flow all of our motivations, our desires, our ambitions. It's really the center and the seat of all of our decision making. And Moses says God is supposed to be of utmost, highest loving importance in the most central parts of our heart. Now, I'm going to talk about practices in a minute, but I'm trying to get this idea into us so that we understand all of our practices are going to flow from our commitments. All of our practices are going to flow from our loves, the things that we're most highly aligned to and allegiant to. And Moses believes that flows from your heart. This, this is a continuous problem all through the Old Testament. They, they, Paul, uh, Paul, he wrote Isaiah. Paul, uh, Isaiah says, these people draw near to me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Their fear of me is commandments taught by men. That's Isaiah 29. When he talks about that, he says like, all of this lists of obedience and things that you're going to do are just, this fear of me is just sort of a man-centered approach. You've got all the lip service, you've got all the sacrifices, you've got all the externals that you're doing, but your heart is still at home. Your heart is far from me in this relationship. 
So when the gospel comes in and you get into the New Testament, Paul says this in Romans 6, he goes, thanks be to God that you who were once slaves of sin have become obedient from the heart to the standard of teaching to which you were committed. Isn't that our goal? True, authentic obedience from the heart to God. So that's where Moses begins. Love the Lord your God with all your heart. Number two is with all your soul. This probably has to do with the uniqueness of our personalities, the uniqueness of our makeup. I have some kids who like sports, some kids who like to do hair. I've got some kids who like to draw. I've got some kids who like to sing well and sing poorly. I've got a variety of children who are all made up of different wirings and different personalities, but all of them, we want to have a personal relationship with God. So whether or not you're an extrovert, an introvert, whether you're a guitarist or a journaler, or you're a, I'm into sports or I'm into reading, whatever it is, I want to understand that love of God is expected of this next generation, no matter how you're wired, that you would engage with the God who knows you, loves you, and rescued you according to the way that you have been wired. There's a beauty in the church to that. Because you'll have people in the church who are able to minister to others because of the way that they're wired. The gifts that they have, the, the perspectives in their life, the way that they engage with God. So heart, soul, and might. Literally might is all your very muchness. So how would you translate that? Often it's of an adverb and it's translated exceedingly or mightily. So it may be a summary of the heart and soul. It may have something to do with resources. Do you, tell me, do you model something before your kids in the way that you handle the resources and the way you spend your money? Do you tell them something about what's valuable and important by the missionaries that are on your fridge or the intentional ways that you give and sacrifice and take a meal and serve a neighbor, right? You're, you're modeling something for them that what we have is meant to be at the disposal of God. What we have is not necessarily to amass and to make our world better as our particular little family. So heart, soul, might. So as we consider what we're going to get into here in terms of these practices, our, our love of God is almost always, you know, exclusively perhaps in our culture understood as feeling. Uh, and while that's, you know, there's a part of that, of loving God uh, with our feeling, and we'll feel, you know, you recognize your feelings kind of do this throughout the course of your life, right? Some, I feel close to God. I feel like God's not here. I feel like he's experiencing his love. I feel like I'm not. And we have a way to uh, live our lives kind of based on our feelings. But the way Moses lays this out, though, is think more often about the commitments, the diligent, disciplined choices you are making to put God first, to display your love of him by making him your highest priority. Um, so as we get into these practices, one of the things that you'll recognize is specifically throughout the scriptures is that the practices that are given to God's people, uh, they have kind of a shelf life to them. Uh, the practices that um, God gives to, to remember and to remind what he has done in the family uh, have a way of being forgotten over the generations. You remember when they come out of the Jordan River, God tells Joshua and the, and the people to take stones and to build this monument on the other side of the Jordan. And, and it says, in the days to come, when your children ask, what's this? You're to tell them what God has done and how he has led and how he redeemed you and how he brought you into this land. So there's this, this perspective that the, the practices we have have a tendency to be either forgotten or neglected or outright um, ignored in the coming generation. So all practices that we're going to talk about here, I'm just going to give a bunch of examples of the way we do it now. And perhaps they'll change and perhaps you can use them. Perhaps you'll do different stuff in your house. But recognize the attempts that we're making are attempts to connect the physical to the spiritual, the material to the immaterial, the present transient things to the things that are eternal. So here's your first one. Here's your first practice in verse six. Are you with me so far? You got... We're a listening community who listens to who God is. We're meant to respond to him in loving submission with all of who we are and everything that he's given us. What's the first way you do that in verse 6? These words that I command you today 
shall be on your heart. The secret to great love of God, to prioritizing his commandments, to understanding who he is, really lies in this practice right here. This feels like the most inefficient spiritual practice that you can take up right now. And it's, and it's meditation on God's word. It's important. It's the way that you're going to experience the love of God in your heart. It's going to be the, the thing that's going to allow you to begin to take a spiritual perspective into that play date, into that conversation with a kid who's not treating your kid the way he wants to, with the, the expectations you have for your children, how they're going to engage their friends. It, it, that meditation on God's word, the, the kind of the muttering that exists, the, the verse that you're turning over and over and over in your head, that truth that you're wringing the stuff, the do out of, really provides the ongoing reality of Christ in your heart. So you know this, our spiritual lives don't grow mathematically, right? It's not take two verses, you'll be mature by Thursday, right? Our, 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 our lives, they grow organically. You watch this with your kids, they lean out and then they get fatter. They stretch out and then they get stronger. So we recognize that my spiritual life grows in lurches, and it feels like for long periods of time, I'm just on a plateau. I'm about a six. But the meditating on God's word helps prepare me for situations both in parenting, in marriage, in work, in uh, the next seasons of life that God is drawing us into, to difficult pathways where we have to walk through the valley of the shadow of death. Those, that meditative practice for Moses becomes one of the key practices of this community. Don't just hear it and do it. Hear it, do it, think about it. Hear it, meditate on it. What does this mean for me in my marriage, in my parenting, in the way I talk to my son or my daughter? How is God forming my hope and my dreams and my parenting through the ways that the things that I think about? Our organic growth goes like this. We all with unveiled face beholding the glory of the Lord, Paul says in 2 Corinthians 3. Our what? Our being transformed. Well, how, how are you going to behold the glory of the Lord if not through consistent biblical exposure to know who this God is, to know what Jesus is like. So right now, what truths of God are on your heart this week? What, what elements of Christ and who he is are forming the inner dialogue in your heart? I don't know if you still do this. Steve used to do this. He used to have, you'd drive in the car with him, you'd feel like a terrible Christian because Steve would have like the word of God like right under his odometer. And <laughs> And I'd be like, oh, what's he doing? Oh, he's memorizing scripture. What am I doing? I'll listen into songs. I just, you know, I do all sorts of stuff. But like, S Steve has a way of just, I don't know if that's just, you're, you still do that? That's good. He's honest, too. He's a man of integrity. <laughs> I used to do that. Not so much. What are the way, my wife, would, we would put up these uh, proverbs around our house. And I thought they were for the kids until I realized they were for <laughs> us. And she would have them on red four by six cards. They'd be on our, you know, at a certain point, you record, like your practices have a shelf life. I'd just stop seeing them. These big red flash cards would be by the front door. They'd be on the, on the cabinet. They'd be on the wall over here. And they'd be a variety of proverbs in the way that we're meant to and we want to talk to one another. But they would form sort of the meditative backbone of the way that we wanted, the kind of parents we wanted to be. So when you, our kids always know, like, we, this is what we do. You don't have to do this. You can do this a different way. Our kids always know where to find us at about 5.30 in the morning. It's mom and dad sitting on the couch with a Bible. And my children, my little ones who don't want to stay in bed, they come down and they look around the stairs. And they look at mom and dad on the couch. Can we come down? No, this is mom and dad's time. We're going to spend time in God's word. We're going to finish. We're going to go do our next thing. Go back upstairs be quiet, you can play in your beds, which turns into tap dancing and <laughs> wrestling and all, you know. But there's some sense for you parents where you, you've got to prioritize your relationship with God. There's got to there's be a way, whether it's, you can listen, you know, whatever, listen to it on an app. Mark, you use a, you listen to a scripture on an app, right? The what one? Dwell. The Dwell app. 
ESV has an app. I, when I run and I work out, I'll listen through a book of the Bible. Listen to it, read it, whatever way that you have a way of getting God's word into your mind and heart is a part of what I think Moses is saying here. What are your patterns of meditation? Because what we meditate on, out of the abundance of the heart, what? The mouth speaks. Your meditation informs your conversation. The things you're thinking about, about God and who he is and what he's like, flows out of you. And my kids surprise me with stuff like this. We had to discipline our son for something the other day because he did something stupid. And uh, we, had, we explained to him, here's why we're disciplining you. Here are the consequences of your behavior because you chose not to listen. You chose not to come. You directly disobeyed the thing that we said. And I took him to, this is maybe a day or two later, I took him to baseball practice and he's in the car and he goes, we're just driving and baseball is done. He's on the way back and he goes, dad, now I know why you disciplined me. It's for my good. <laughs> Right. Uh, you you want to be ready. I, I want to be ready for those conversations. I don't want to get, I get, still get surprised. I have no idea what he's thinking about, right? Usually he's like beatboxing and running as fast as he can throughout the house. But when those moments give me an opportunity, I want to be ready to be able to meditate on, yeah, you know why we discipline you? Because God disciplines us for our good, that we might share in his holiness. God wants us to be different than who we are. So we discipline you because God disciplines me, and God wants me to be different. So that helps to form the conversation in our home, that meditation in the heart and mind of that parent. Verse 7. Here's where we start to move into how, we, how our practices inform what's happening with our kids. Number seven, you shall teach them diligently to your children. And what's fascinating to me is that word for teach is not the word that you would expect for teach. It's literally the word, word that's translated in a variety of places throughout the Old Testament, usually with what it means to sharpen. So the idea that Moses is giving you here is of you taking a hammer and a chisel and a block of granite and you impressing upon this next generation the truth of God. Now that's no shade at your children being dumb as rocks, but there's something there in the way that Moses recognizes as you're going to deliver this truth to the next generation, it's going to take sweat, hard work, and it's going to be uh, you trying to make an impression this is the example I thought of for this. Ladies, you may not, maybe you do if you have a background in baseball. Do you know how you break in a baseball glove? When you get a baseball glove, it's basically like cardboard. And you put your fingers in it and it's no good to you because you can't catch the ball. What you need and what they make are these wooden mallets. You can either go and catch a thousand baseballs in it and finally it'll beat the leather into submission and that's when the glove is good, when it's been worked out and the leather has stretched and the creases are in it. Or you can take this mallet, and this is what my son does as he runs around the house beatboxing, is he will take this mallet on this new glove that I just got him and he will boom, 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 boom. We, we can be talking about all sorts of stuff and there's Joel, boom, 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 boom. Do it. Boom, boom, boom. Just son. It's 6.30 in the morning. <laughs> I know you're starting the day early. But the, the image in my mind and the image that Moses wants to give to you is that this next generation is meant to be impressed upon because they're impressionable. And you know this with young kids. We, well, I have done this with all sorts of um, just dumb stuff that I have made up with my kids that is stuck. I debated on whether or not to do this. Can you guys hold rhythm? See, three of you are laughing. The rest of you are like, I don't know exactly what that is. Steve's got it. Steve's got it. So, <laughs> that's it. So, we were, um, I did the, I, the only reason I do this uh, is to give you an idea of the things that are going to make an impression on your children. My children could still come in here and do this right now. Okay, you with me? Two, three, four. That's a two and a four, white folks. <laughs> one, okay, clap. One, three, one, three. Oh, uh, three, one, two. Come on, feel like you mean it. One, two, you're never, yeah. You're never gonna forget this, keep going. One, keep going, practice. Addison taught a sermon 18 months ago in our church and he taught it from Psalm 63. We left the church that day to go to Lewis to celebrate. 
and we went up to Lewis to get barbecue. And I'm in the car, and I'm trying to think about what is it that Addison taught us today? Come on, to get, don't, hey, don't get lazy. So I'm in the car with my children trying to remember. Here's what Addison said, because I want them to remember what God's word has said to them out of Psalm 63. And here's what I did. One, Psalm 63 says this to me. When I'm hungry and I'm thirsty, God satisfies me. Psalm 63 says this to me, that when I'm hungry and I'm thirsty, God satisfies me. Molly's in the back. What, what, what? <laughs> we got the whole car. You can get, we got the, you'll never forget Psalm 63 now. You'll never forget it. You'll be beatboxing in the car over that two and four on the way. I know you guys. What am I doing? Psalm 63 is so important to my children that they would know when they're hungry and thirsty and at the end of themselves that God is their total satisfaction. Right? And as dumb as the song is, I got another one for Psalm 2, but you guys can't handle it because it's three and on the, <laughs> it's one, three and, we won't do that. But don't you want your kids to know that when I'm at the end of myself, God is their satisfaction, right? So whatever dumb stuff, dads, you got full cred to be able to do this. Make up dumb crap in your home. Make up stuff your kids aren't going to forget. Beat it into the baseball glove. So whether it's framing, whether it's Psalm 63, whether it's Psalm 2, whether it's other passages that we come to and we think about, we try to make stuff memorable for our kids to drill it into them. You shall teach them diligently to your children. You shall talk of them when you sit at your house. This for us is mealtimes. I, uh, I do one date a week with one of my kids, and it takes me six different weeks to get through all my kids. So every six weeks, I have a breakfast with my children. I used to do it. I'd just do it at random. And I'd be like, it's breakfast week. And my wife would be like, we can't handle daily breakfast. And it throws the whole, everybody's crying. Half of the kids want to go. They can't, I go, all right, so I had a schedule, and we do. So for us, I do one breakfast a week with my kids, and it's a conversation. I take them to a place that they want to go. We sit down. We typically read the proverb of the day. I pull out a section of Proverbs. I have them read it, and I go, let's talk about what this is. Now, when you're young and your kids are little and immobile, uh, you can do different stuff. You can read shorter things. You can uh, watch, you can read uh, Bible books that have pictures in them. I, we've used uh, a variety of script, a variety. I've, I go, gosh, I've picked stuff that's terrible to do. I can tell you stuff not to do. We've been through that Bible. We've been through the Old Testament, the New Testament book that are over there. We've been through the storybook Bible. We go, we just pick one and we go through it. Because we want the, the formation of our home, the, the resource matters less. Like, I, let me tell you, like, I will sit down and I will read with my little ones, my five and six year old, and I'll be sitting here like this, reading, and they're on my. Dad, can you read this, sir? And I'm sitting and I'm reading whatever book on whatever dog or whatever thing is going. And man, I underestimated, I did not expect this to be a part of it. My 13 year olds will hear that I'm reading. And they'll slowly make their way behind to watch. Why? I don't know why. But for some reason, that intentional moment where we're all sitting down and we're all reading something together provides a, a foundation. It provides a repeatable experience where we go, our family sits down. I do this for about Five to ten minutes in the morning, we're going through the book of Jonah right now. We read a, three or four verses of Jonah. We talk about it. What's Jonah doing? What's God like? I end the time basically with two particular prayer requests. God, where do we need your help? And God, how can we thank you for who you are? That's it. That takes anywhere from seven to 49 minutes, depending on how many how much conversation has to be had and how many people, you know, did he have a brother? I'm like, I don't know if Jonah had a brother. That's not in the Bible. I don't know. <clears throat> but that talk about them when you sit in your house is the opportunity. This is the marrow of the family home. You get the opportunity to tell them about Jesus walking on water for the first time. 
You get the chance to tell them these stories of, can you imagine that Elijah would do this? Can you imagine what it must have been like to be there? And you get this, this chance to have conversations with your children about a real God who really acted in history to really love, serve, and care for his people. Our conversations at the dinner table, and I th you guys know this with kids, your dialogue with your children is essential to creating character. It's just essential. It, that dialogue, I mean, Jared was, and Reagan were talking about this and the ways that they were talking about engaging their kids and the things that they watch. We do this too with friendships, with things we watch on TV. We'll pause it and we go, was that a good decision or a bad decision? Was that a selfish decision or was that a godly decision? Was that a person who sacrificed for the good of others or was that somebody who were just following their own way? Why did they choose that? Why did they say that? Was that right or wrong? You do that with conflict. What did you want to happen when you hit them in the face with the board? What did you expect would happen when you were playing dogs and it turned into a dog fight? Right? So you're always in this dialogue and conversation with your children where you as a parent are, are trying to bring them back into inserting the truth of God into their scenarios and into their world. You're going to talk about them when you sit in their house. I think you heard that from Mary and Doug, but the way that they, their posture was and the way that they listened to the things that their kids were saying, the way that they were engaging eye to eye with their children showed that they were engaged with what their kids were thinking, processing, feeling, planning, doing, right? So make the, the pattern in your house that we talk about these things. We talk about what God, God's like. We talk about sin. I, you know, I, for the... I think Mary and Doug said this, the specific response, man, I'm saying amen and jumping up and down, waving a hanky last night. Because my kids do this all the time. I'm sorry, I was mad at you. I go, no, that is not an apology. You're sorry that you're idol, I'm not serving your idolatry. I don't get that specific with them. <laughs> you get it though, right? I'm sorry I was mad. No, let's have specific repentance. There is no generalized confession that receives specific grace. It's specific confessions for specific sins that unlocks the grace of God to release forgiveness. That's how God has wired it. Confess your sins. Be specific. I teach my kids that. You shall talk to them when you sit in your house. Number, uh, the next one, when you walk by the way. Like I said, dads and breakfasts, that's what we do. We do that. Uh, I, like, I know that in the early phases of life, walking by the way is a developmentally inappropriate thing, right? So you got the first two to three years before your kids start walking. But once your kids start to get into that five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, we're mobile in our life. We're, we're doing stuff. We're going places. My wife has taken them to Target. She's engaging with the homeless lady. She's talking with my children about why she would give the homeless lady this or that, why, uh, how people get into that situation in life. What are the struggles that happen in a sinful world where I'm taking my son to practice and I'm asking him, did you see the way that boy treated his father? Was that right or wrong? Did you see whether or not he was respectful to the coach? Did you see whether or not he, I say this, to my, this is another phrase that I use with my kids, uh, that leaders look out for the little ones. And I say all the time, you might be big, fast, strong, and tough on the baseball field, but if you're not willing to be a leader to include and to involve the people who can't help themselves, who don't have the influence, who aren't as fast and as strong and as important, your team is gonna be terrible because leaders look out for the little ones. So I, we ask these questions, what did you hear? What did you see? What was going on? Was that a right response or a wrong response? Was that uh, something that was important to stand up for or was that something we can let go? How would you respond? Were you frustrated? What did you hope would happen? What do you think God is teaching you? We, we, we just, we try to weave this as we're going in our life, right? So just as I would say and encourage you, make the attendance and the listening to God's word a part of your weekly rhythm. I'm gonna say the very same thing on this side and say don't leave God in that 90 minutes throughout the week. Don't think that we just worship God on Sunday and Monday through Saturday as us and we pursue our dreams and ambitions, but bring your meditating on God's word into your Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, right? And recognize God's, God's just as much God on my Monday through Saturday as he is when we're all dressed up and we're singing together on Sunday. 
He's just as much involved. He's just as much working out uh, our salvation, right? It, it, God who is at work, what's he say? Work out your salvation with fear and trembling, for it's God who is at work in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. What God is doing in your life in that Monday through Saturday feels like the marrow of our lives. It feels like the fears and anxieties and uncertainties and the plans and hopes and dreams. And God's right involved in all of those things. So we talk about it as we're walking by the way. We're talking about the ways that we repent with our children, the things that we have done wrong, the things that we didn't believe about God, the things that we're praying for that we hope God shows up in. That conversation for in, in the home forms the, the unity of the home in the way that God wants to interact with us and our families. When you lie down and when you rise. Mornings and evenings are very important moments. You know that in the day? Scripturally speaking, they're important moments. So David will say, uh, it's good to give thanks to the Lord, to sing praises to your name, O Most High, to declare your steadfast love in the morning and your faithfulness by night. We typically have a morning routine. By the end of the day, we're, you know, we're barely hanging together. We got, we got emotions and conversation and showers and all that kind of stuff. But typically what we'll do is we'll read in the morning together. Our little ones, we try to put them to bed. And what we do is we spend time trying to impress upon them the truths of the faith through song. So we sing four or five songs to our children, typically hymns, which have words in them that five-year-olds don't understand, but that's okay. We keep singing to them, and we make that a part of our evening rhythm so that we're setting their minds on the things and the truths of God, which leads to conversations. And, you know, God, Dad, what's a diadem? And I'm, go to bed. <laughs> Why did I sing that song? Uh, so David, you know, David will say, I'll, I'll um, uh, let me hear in the morning of your steadfast love. He'll say, I prepare a sacrifice for you and watch. So that David has this, this morning and evening kind of dynamic to his spiritual life. Start the day, end of the day. Verse 8, you'll bind them as a sign on their hand and they'll be as frontlets between your eyes. Now whether this is liter literative, liter thank you, literal or figurative, I don't think it really matters. It became literal in the life of the Jews where they'd really wear these banners on their foreheads and these things on their wrists. But the idea I think that Moses gives us is that our eyes and our in our head help us give perspective, right? So what we want is just like I do the frame, I want God's perspective on things, that God has the right to interrupt my perspective with his truth, but two, God has the right to hold me accountable for the things I do with my hands, the thing I touch, click, grasp, give, right? All of, all of those things that are tactile in the way that we relate to one another. So we want to embrace those practices and perspectives that are involved in disciplining ourselves to godliness, we want to show our kids those things. God has the right to give us the right perspective and to help us use our hands. Verse 9, you'll write them on the doorposts of your house. Now, if you have any Jewish friends, you, you will know that this is a part of Jewish life. Here's what one Jew wrote when they were explaining what this is. This is the doorpost is called the mezuzah in Hebrew. A mezuzah serves two functions. Every time you enter or leave, the mezuzah reminds you that you have a covenant with God. Second, the mezuzah serves as a symbol to everyone else that this particular dwelling is constituted as a Jewish household operating by a special set of rules, rituals, and beliefs. So our practices help us get to the point to where we're able to say we're this kind of family. So that a Jewish family would be recognized by having that mezuzah on the door frame and they would say this is who we are. This is what we're like. And then finally, the way these practices show up, listen, because we're an individualistically minded community, we have a tendency to neglect the fact that God expects the salvation and the truth of who he is to inform our personal lives, the practices in our family, our household, and then the gates. You know what the gates are? They don't, this isn't the nice part of town. You didn't get that? Gated community. Jews live in gated community. That's not the point. Gates are the furthest, most outward-facing nature of the community. It's where the laws and the decisions were made. So that the gates of the city would protect the boundaries of the people of God and the way that they interacted with their community. So here's the point. As we think about the priority of putting God's word on display and we begin to 
walk that out in these practices. What you have is this set of concentric circles where we're expected to now practice and give our kids the alphabet and the grammar of what it means to be a Christian, what it means to be a family who follows the Lord. Because we don't just want to give them personal, individual disciplines. We want to give them ways that they can interact. Because as you get into the New Testament, what you recognize is that the New Testament is filled with ways that we're meant to relate to one another. So as you think about these practices, think about them in the context personally, about their own meditation. Think about them in their community and their relationships that they have. And then think about them in the context of the greater community of God's people to whom they're meant to be accountable and responsible for. All right? We're out of time. Write them on the doorposts of your gates. So I'm going to hand it to John, and we'll be done. Let me pray, and that'll close our time, and then John will give you just two more minutes, and then we'll be done. Father, we uh, pray that this would impact the families and the children that are represented in this room. We pray that you would do exceeding above what we ask or think and the ways that we seek to order our homes to honor you with the... uh, your word with loving you with our heart, soul, mind, and strength. I pray for the the husbands and wives, the men and women in this room who are seeking to be faithful parents in this season, that you would give them great encouragement as they leave here today. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.